The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Parallel Perspectives, a unique look at HIV treatment decisions from the provider and the patient with doctors David Malbranch and Peter Shallot and patient advocate Scott Bertani. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerreview.com forward slash ZWH860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. David Malbranch. I'm an internal medicine physician in Atlanta, Georgia. And welcome to this educational activity that will examine treatment decisions for HIV from the perspective of both the provider and the patient. Joining me in this discussion are Dr. Peter Shallot, who is in private practice and is also a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington, and Mr. Scott Bertani, a patient advocate joining us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Peter and Scott, welcome to our program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's dive right in and talk about some historical perspectives on the success of HIV antiretroviral therapy. Uh, Peter, I'll start with you. Your thoughts about just looking back over the past 40 years about where we've been with antiretroviral therapy and where we are right now. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, it's been an amazing trip, really, to think about it. I trained in the 1980s. Um, so when I started in medical school, we had no treatment for HIV. It was just really being learned about. Um, and then in, in the 80s, we had one drug that, that wasn't effective at, at keeping people healthy. In the early 90s, uh, we started having more nucleosides, but again, uh, they didn't have a huge impact on health. But then the real kind of uh, 180 degree change came in the mid 90s when we started having multiple drugs in multiple classes, the protease inhibitors and the non-nucleosides. And that had a huge impact on the health of patients. By then I was in practice and I saw people leave hospice and, and, and go home and, and have a restoration of their quality of life. The problem in the 90s was the complexity and the toxicity of these regimens. And so ever since then, what we've seen is a, a gradual but very steady improvement in the tools we have to keep people healthy in, in the sense of the toxicities have been reduced uh, greatly from the drugs we had in the 90s and the complexity as well. We used to have patients need to take medicines on an empty stomach and then other medicines on a, on a full stomach and multiple times a day and multiple pills. And then by the, the mid uh, 2000s, the, the first decade of, the, of this century, we started having single tablet regimens where the whole cocktail was in one pill. So over time, the, the um, effect of our treatment on the quality of life of our patients has improved so much. Uh, we've been able to suppress the virus effectively since the mid nineties, but uh, the tools we have to do that have also been become much more user-friendly ever since. And now we take this for granted, but I think it's really important to understand the history behind it. We still have a lot of patients who suffered through the treatments that we gave them in the 1990s. And, uh, and yet people that are newly diagnosed really don't appreciate that they're standing on the shoulders of, of folks who've been through a lot more to keep their virus suppressed. And people complain that that their single tablet is the wrong color or a little too big or whatever. They don't know what what they missed by not having to be treated with these more complex regimens. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a blessing seeing from where we were. And I was in I was training in New York City in the mid '90s, late '90s, um, and was working on a, a specific HIV inpatient ward that we usually had like uh, 20 to 25 patients that we'd have to follow who were sick. Some of them we'd have to hold the hands through as they were dying. There were only certain medications that were very toxic, like you said. And then it was like all of a sudden when the triple drug cocktail came out in 97, all of a sudden the HIV inpatient ward became like a ghost town. And so much so in our hospital in New York City that we had to start bringing patients in who were general internal medicine um, to kind of keep the census up. And so it was really an interesting dynamic. Um, Scott, what are your thoughts about kind of the progress you've seen and, and where we've been and where we are right now? 
Sure. As, you know, as a person living with HIV myself since the mid nineties, you know, when I was first diagnosed, like many of those people during the first, you know, that time frame, I, I received not just my HIV diagnosis, but an AIDS classification as well of kind of the, the C3 kind. And it was less than 200 T cells. I had clinical manifestations of oral and esophageal thrush, and it was painful, I recall, to go through, but it was, it was also a, a, a loss of personal agency and a loss of, 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 of self in that respect. And, and it's amazing that today we're talking about issues that discuss resistance versus you know, just getting people on pills. You know, when I first started, I believe I was on 16 pills um, and it was three times a day. I recall even early days, you know, when Nelfenavir, they didn't even coat the tablets. And when I would take it, it would literally melt in my mouth as almost like a sub sublingual tablet. Yep. And the toxicity of some of the, the medications, they certainly, they, they were, they were for many, many people who were desperate in those moments, they would, they would take anything, they would grasp at anything, but today we're, we're talking about living forward. And it's an amazing thing that I've gone from clinical diagnosis of an AIDS manifestations to an HIV positive individual that can now look forward and, and look forward to, to a healthy and happy life. Yeah, I remember um, back then as a resident, I had actually sustained a needle stick in New York hospital while I was sewing up a, a catheter on a patient um, who had a viral load in the 500,000s, a T-cell count mm -hmm. probably in the 20s or 30s. And I had to go on post-exposure prophylaxis at mm -hmm. the time. And all that was available was AZT, 3TC, and Crixivan. Now, back then, a lot of people used to say, all these patients are non-compliant. They're not taking their medications. They're not doing this, this, that, and the other. And I went on that regimen for a month. I can tell you that Crixivan combined with the AZT and 3TC, uh, you're taking one both of them, two of the medications are twice a day. One was three times a day and had to be on an empty stomach. And it was just a nightmare, not to mention the side effects. So I think it's really a blessing that we've come to this point um, from both specifically a patient perspective, as well as, you know, the providers, the ease in which we can care for our patients nowadays. We can't take that for granted. Um, and what's great about having these single tablet regimens is that now we know that people who are living with HIV can actually have a similar life expectancy to someone who is HIV negative, um, providing that they take their medications on time, have good access to medical care, all the other social factors that may get in the way of, of good scientific advancement. Um, we do know, however, that even despite all these advances we've just been talking about, particularly with single tablet regimens and the improvement on the toxicity and the pill burden for our patients, that it's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. So we're at a point right now where patients are living long enough that they're actually getting some of the other long-term chronic medical conditions, either as a direct result of the medications or by the natural aging process. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you manage your patients um, and how you tailor what you're doing with your ART uh, treatment approaches with specific patients in your practice? Sure, so um, I'm a general internist. I, I do primary care, not only for folks with HIV, but folks that don't have HIV. And my population is aging. Uh, the folks with HIV are a little bit more complicated and challenging, but not that much more. There's one more item on their problem list, which is HIV. In some cases, uh, it, it's, almost a non-issue. They're, they're on a medicine that uh, works well for them and, and they're comfortable with it. Um, but there's, there's sort of two uh, special considerations for this population. One is comorbidities. So the uh, comorbidities that I see can be a little bit more common in people with HIV. In particular, in my experience, diabetes is more common in my population in the HIV infected folks. And I think some of that is a toxicity from some of the older meds that they've had. Sure. Um, but other, other issues like cancers, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, high cholesterol, for example, are also more common, uh, vascular disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we deal with those and we deal with those the same way that we would in somebody who's HIV negative. Although we know, for example, that the cardiovascular risk that we calculate for somebody uh, is under is an undercount for people with HIV. The, their risk is higher, and HIV is a cofactor. We don't have a way to quantify that yet. Yeah, the other, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it almost at this point, 
we've been, I know in certain practices and um, certain governing bodies have even talked about including living with HIV as a independent cardiac risk factor, because right. you see some of the data that's coming across, but I'm sorry I interrupted you, go ahead. Oh no, that's fine. Um, I was gonna just say that in the HIV realm, again, uh, many of the sort of uh, veteran patients, long-term patients that I take care of that are older are now on fairly simple regimens, but I still see uh, folks that have multi-resistant virus and, and complex regimens. And so I still work on reducing the complexity and toxicity of, of some of these folks whose options are a lot more limited. Then we have drug interactions with the meds that they take for their comorbidities. So um, it becomes a little more challenging now, Scott, I'll bring you into the conversation too. Um, can you speak a little bit about, you know, Peter talked about the complexity of our patients and kind of what we're seeing. And, and for me as a practicing internist as well, who has HIV uh, expertise, the challenge to me is not so much keeping people virally sustained. Uh, so, um, the, the challenge is not so much keeping people virally suppressed. It's more of managing the other things like diabetes, hypertension, cardiac risk factors, hypercholesterolemia, cancer screening, uh, those kind of things. But there are specific barriers and facilitators that are getting folks into care or preventing folks from getting into care, not only to uh, keep their viral load suppressed, but then also to maintain this kind of healthcare maintenance. Can you speak about uh, some of the things that you've done in your work and some of the things that you've seen in your work uh, as a patient, um, as someone that works in our communities uh, with regards to some of these facilitators and barriers? Um, when, when, individual, when we first started uh, treating individuals with HIV, we were in a much more monolithic type of world, right? There were many individuals that were all blindsided by HIV all at the same time. So we all came from different lives. Now we see HIV as a much more complex and challenging uh, epidemic in that respect. We are seeing individuals that are much more vulnerable to HIV. We see it much more within minority populations and communities that don't have the same access to healthcare or the same utilization of healthcare. Right. So um, we see individuals certainly with HIV related stigma and substance use disorders and lots of complex challenges of people just even onboarding themselves into the healthcare system. We all don't come from the same place, right? There's some people that enter the system through a Ryan White care system, which is a public mm -hmm. sponsored. Then we have the state public health, which is the Medicaid sponsored for individuals who are really at the, at the extreme ends in the margins of, of, uh, of economic disparities and mm -hmm. social determinants of health. And then we have people that are in employer sponsored plans. So we have a different and an uneven playing field. And as individuals really um, age with HIV, we're seeing individuals from the social determinants of health work from the multimorbidities and then individuals that are really within these complex challenging lives. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And one of the things that I, I don't see people talk about a lot is we describe like social context, like you're saying, like insurance, access to care, uh, employment, transportation, food and housing insecurity, mm -hmm. all those things we see. But also I consider the medical system itself as one of those social contextual factors. And when you look at the barriers, like for someone who doesn't have insurance and has to do Ryan White or ADAP, the fact that you have to go in and recertify every six months, when in some cases, people who are virally suppressed shouldn't really have to come in to see their uh, physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs, but every six months. And so that causes a bit of a barrier and some of the cumbersome paperwork and certification process and delays that we see, not to mention um, some of the provider bias that we see, uh, staff bias, staff commentary, stigma that happens just as much in the clinics itself as it does in society. I think it really adds complexity to someone who is living with HIV and also dealing with the aging process and all the comorbidities that come with that. Because it's like, well, God, I get all this stuff that is happening to me in my in my day to day life, and then I come into a place that's supposed to be a sanctuary that I'm supposed to feel comfortable, and it's all this paperwork, bureaucracy, and sometimes stigma and bias that I have to deal with. I think there are a lot of barriers that can happen with that. Right. There's so many different ways that people engage in the system. That you know, in the treatment world, we think of medical case management activities as viral load suppression, but we're more than the sum total of what our viral loads are. 
we often need those supportive services to help engage us and stay retained in a lifelong care and treatment activity. Right. Those are all the things and the challenges that you talk about, healthcare navigation, insurance complexities, even being denied with, with uh, the formularies that are being you know, prescribed for individuals. Not everybody even has the same access to the same medication. So I, I would say there's so many different challenges and it really takes a village in this respect to make sure that someone stays adherent to their medication, but not just in adherent to their medication, but adherence to the whole health person notion of what it means to be an individual living with HIV and all the needs that follow. Right. It's a, it's a great point. Peter, I want to bring you back in with regards to uh, discussing some of these wraparound services that we've been talking about. How important are those in your practice and for the patients that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? <clears throat> well, I, I have a small clinic. We do a lot of these things ourselves. We, we do refer out when we can to uh, agencies that can help our patients navigate the system. Um, I think that uh, sort of getting back to the whole issue of retention and care and, and helping the folks living with HIV um, uh, interact with systems that are that are unfriendly. Um, I, I, I just like to, to put out this one word, uh, which is R E S P E C T, uh, <laughs> respect, which was recently uh, named the the top song of all time by Rolling Stone, and then uh, also uh, was named the top protest song of all time. And and the reason I think that's important is because when sometimes we see patients who haven't been engaged in the system because they see the system as unfriendly. Uh, it, it could be the, a social services agency, it could be a governmental agency, it could be the medical, the healthcare system. They see the system as unfriendly and they come into care kind of grudgingly and, and maybe have sort of a confrontive attitude because they're used to being treated disrespectfully. Right. And that can have to do with who they are in terms of their, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, mm -hmm. their sexual orientation. And you can't engage people and you can't get them to avail themselves of these services that they're eligible for unless they feel that they're going to be treated with respect. And as providers, it starts with us, right? So if we can show the patient that whatever it is about their life that may stigmatize them in the greater society, that that is not going to stigmatize them within the, the walls of our uh, clinic, then they relax, they engage, they trust. It takes time, right? But I think it's a great service that we can perform for our patients, which is to treat them with respect no matter what. And then the other benefits flow from there. If I can reassure them, and I'll just give an example. I'm yeah. gonna talk about transgender folks, okay? Who um, are probably one of the most uh, stigmatized groups still in, in this country, especially transgender people of color. If they come to our clinic, they're often fearful and, and uh, sort of confrontive because they're afraid of being treated with disrespect. But then if we need to avail, help them avail themselves of services outside of our clinic, it's really important that we reassure them, that we tell them, yes, this agency, this specialist, whatever is gender friendly, is not going to snicker about you in the hall outside the room, et cetera. Uh, it takes a lot of encouragement and generation of trust to do that. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do for our patients is is help treat them with respect and help guide them through a system that really is often unfriendly. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing point that you made. I just wanna make, uh, give, I'll give two further examples about what you said, and then um, we'll move forward to talking about, a little bit about specific uh, antiretroviral therapies that we give. I ran into a, a former uh, patient of mine that I used to see over a decade ago outside of a, uh, a cafe uh, last week, and he was talking it up with a friend we were just talking about providers and he was seeing a different provider at that time. And the, the other person who was with him was living with diabetes as well and was very open about living with diabetes. And they both talked about, and they used the exact word you said, which was respect. And they talked about having a, a patient provider relationship where the provider is actually really cool and almost just speaks 
like a friend would to another friend or to a family member. And I think in the past, historically with medicine, we've been brainwashed to think that if we speak to patients like that on a very friendly level, that somehow that's unprofessional. And we have to keep this facade that it needs to be very austere and very stoic. And that's not what is gonna get across specifically with uh, people who are living with HIV and the populations we serve. People want something that's more uh, relatable, something that's more respectful, something that's more, hey, I got your back. Um, I'm going to be here for you. That means that you can connect with someone and be professional in how you treat them at the same time. And I would even argue that approaching people that way with that level of respect and connection is going to be the level of respect people need. Just an example of the stigma that does happen. Literally before um, we came on to have this conversation, a friend of mine texted me and said, well, I have a 17 year old that wants to you know, know where he can get tested for STIs. Uh, he had condomless sex a couple days ago and is now having a discharge. So I gave him the number to a clinic and he said that he called and told, explained the situation to someone at the front desk and said, hey, can I have this kid come in and see you? Uh, he has a discharge, he had, he had condomless sex the other day. And then the person on the phone said, well, that's what condoms are for. Mm. And, and so, and so this is kind of the thing that we're dealing with. And when we talk about cultural humility and respect, we must be clear that it's not just the providers that steer away from that level of respect. It's every person that someone will have contact with as they navigate the healthcare system. Scott, I saw you shaking your head. What are your thoughts on that? Have you experienced a lot of that or seen a lot of that in your work? Sure. I mean, you know, much of the increased rates of behavioral health conditions that are experienced by LGBTQ community is it's often correlated with, you know, interpersonal and, and institutional and structural discrimination. And, and unfortunately, the, the discrimination and stigma faced by LGBTQ people, you know, it puts them at a, at a higher risk for even further behavioral health conditions, including mental health conditions and substance use disorders more often than on LGBTQ people. And, and too often seeking health care services, including treatment for behavioral health conditions, you know, it puts people at a risk of experiencing discrimination or stigma, which can then only exacerbate the behavioral health, you know, conditions for those individuals. And coming into a, 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 a clinical world, it should be affirming. Um, it should be inclusive. It should be open so that you can retain the individual and not just the point of care needs that they have right now, mm -hmm. but for a lifelong experience mm -hmm. of affirming them within this this you know healthcare system, and it's the only way to get people engaged. Indeed, indeed, and I love that word "engaged" over retention. Retention reminds me of a correctional facility, like keeping somebody retained in something. I like engagement because it it, uh, it denotes a kind of bi-directional uh, relationship. And I also think, as a seventeen-year-old, what would I think if I have a discharge and someone's telling me, "Well, that's what condoms are for." Like the last thing I need is somebody judging me for having sex without a condom when I'm um, 17 years old. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the specific ART regimens that we have. And uh, Peter, I'll direct this towards you. You have a newly diagnosed patient and they're ready to start treatment. And you know we have a whole bunch of guidelines and options available. Can you talk about some of the factors that you consider when recommending an initial regimen? Um, and are there kind of any go-to regimens that you use for certain situations, uh, those kind of things? Or do you go by the guidelines? Do you, you know, stick with the guidelines just by themselves? Or are there situations where you go outside of guidelines? How is your approach to uh, treating a, a newly diagnosed patient uh, with HIV who seeks treatment from you? Well, <clears throat> my approach has evolved a lot <clears throat> over the years. Um, and my relationship with the guidelines has evolved as well, because uh, I've always said that guidelines are just guidelines. They're not, not rules, but the guidelines have become better and better, more evidence-based and more um, convincing to me over time. Um, there, we are now in the mode of trying to, uh, at least offering people to start therapy at their first visit, either when they're first diagnosed or when they first present for care. And my experience with that is that, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the patients that I see <clears throat> who, are, who are newly diagnosed are actually very interested. I, I, I phrase it like um, you could start treatment now or, or we could uh, 
check a bunch of labs and have you come back once the labs are back and then we can talk more about treatment. So, so then the question is, what, what do you give them? And uh, the DHHS guidelines and the IASUSA guidelines both recommend a uh, second generation integrase inhibitor and nucleosides in, in some way or other. Uh, and we have data on some of these combinations in rapid start. We have data on, on giving them to people who haven't had any tests done other than their HIV test. Uh, the patients that I see are usually most interested in a single tablet. So I tell the, the usually I tell the patient, you know, we can change this later, but here's a way to get your viral load down now, uh, which will um, improve your health and also uh, prevent you from uh, being able to transmit the virus to other people once the virus is completely suppressed. And again, most people choose that. Some people, and again, uh, people that are more hesitant, or as we were saying, people that are a little bit suspicious of the whole system, right. and doctors just want to push pills, um, sometimes it's better to uh, get the labs, show them their viral load, and again, explain why it's not good to have uh, actively replicating HIV in their bodies. And, and go from there. And again, the guidelines are just guidelines, but um, single tablet and um, simplicity is, is probably the key here. Yeah, I, th I couldn't agree more. I think there's a lot of dynamics that come into play and some of them are very specific uh, with patients if they're taking other meds, if they're, yeah. uh, you know, if they have a certain living situation, um, whatever their job is and where they're required to be, what time is best for them to be taking the medication. But I think one of the things that we, and at least in my experience, what I've learned with folks is that not only having a single tablet regimen, but also the pill size is a huge, huge deal with folks. And I don't know about your clinic, but the clinics that I've worked, we've always had those kind of little uh, foldable setups with, that have yep. the actual pills and show the size yep. and the medications. And it always amazes me that someone who's uh, newly diagnosed with HIV, I'm sitting down counseling them about medications, and I show them that they always make a beeline to Bictegravir, Taf, and Emtricitabine because it's the smallest pill. They run away from the other ones that are bigger. And I, I try to always bring in, well, tell me about your other medications. Tell me about your other comorbidities. Tell me about your other medical issues or some of the other things that are important to you in taking a medication. But I can tell you with a lot of certainty that my patients in Atlanta, George, love to have a small pill. All right, Scott, what are your thoughts about, about all that? Uh, I was going to bring you into this. What, do you, what are your thoughts about kind of this initial regimen, what you've seen and what you've experienced? Sure. I mean, you know, to, to echo off what you guys were saying, I mean, I remember when I had started Epivir, it was a diamond-shaped little pill, and it was the most lovely jagged little pill that I had ever taken because it was the smallest pill. And I remember I felt as though I was beginning a, a normalized system of just regular treatments, right, in that respect. Yeah. But unfortunately, these days, you know, as, as individuals are onboarded into the system, there's a systematic and a cost affordability barrier, barrier on HIV care and prevention drug access and utilization that that are really jeopardizing effective treatment for individuals that are on state Medicaid programs right. um, or any program that has a drug utilization review board. You know, they are looking at uh, formularies, not in terms of patient enhanced access and engagement services. They're looking at it truly from a cost of affordability issue. Mm -hmm. And it's really starting to undermine the provider patient relationship about What's your favorite color of pill? What is your preference of, of your lifestyle on how you take pills? Is it better right. to take one pill versus three pills? And we are seeing that these systematic issues are being pushed more at the margins of individuals that are engaged in public uh, insurance programs like the ADAP program or mm -hmm. the state Medicaid programs. And they're they're looking at their their list or that 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 formulary as being reduced in favor of what is most um, cost affordable to you, and that's that's something that is a concern for us, especially as these, you know, these treatment uh, guidelines really favor single tab regimens over multi tab regimens for people that live in complex, challenging lives. Yeah, it almost seems reflective. I think. Um... 
the dynamic and the landscape with HIV care is very much under the umbrella of the general medical system, which is in general about cost cutting and about increasing profits and all these kind of other things. I think, unfortunately, particularly for people living with HIV, there's so many conditions and it's so urgent that we actually get people the best medications they have, yeah. that that cost cutting approach is kind of an erroneous thing to look at. Um, I want to uh, focus with you, Scott, just for a quick second and ask a little bit, and I'll bring this back to Peter, but as far as side effects are concerned, we talked a little bit about that earlier with the, the harder regimens. And I remember back in the day, um, you know, we talked about lipodystrophy a lot. So we yeah. would talk about the buffalo hump from some of the older protease inhibitors that would happen on the neck, some of the uh, abdominal fat that we would see, some of the wasting in the calves and in the triceps that we would see with some patients with some of those older regimens. What are you hearing on the street? What's your experience personally and with other people you work with with regards to what are the major concerns that people have living with HIV now about some of these single tablet regimens um, and some of the cons there? Right, you know, with, with HIV cr comes lifelong um, chronic inflammation and um, it puts us at greater risk for multimorbidity um, for, for many things. I mean, I, you know, when I first started out, I, I really didn't care what pills were available. I, I would take whatever protease inhibitors or whatever, you know, uh, non-nukes or nukes that were available to us um, with, you know, concern that sure, there could be some, you know, atrophy or distro, you know, my, uh, you know, buffalo hump, the, the issues mm -hmm. that you're saying, I'm still, you know, uh, 30 years nearly into an HIV infection, I'm still issue, you know, with my, my stomach in that respect. So, you know, the, the side effects are much less, but they're starting to hinder my body a lot more. You know, you talked about toxicity and the challenges of HIV and inflammation and all of this is coming together that still brings, you know, issues like high cholesterol, um, certainly cardiovascular risk, you know, triglycerides with some of the medications, you know, weight gain, Mm -hmm. um, is also a concern, you know, with some of the newer, uh, tenofovir or the tenofovir disoprobal fumarate, you know, the mm -hmm. TDF versus the TD TAF. So there's still some challenges sure. with some side effects. Um, but they are much, much less than what they used to be, right. but where we see is for people that are aging, we're getting so much more multimorbidities. All right. And Peter, what are your thoughts about that? Um, as a provider, what have you been seeing? I know Scott just mentioned the weight gain that we've seen, uh, and we're familiar with a lot of the clinical trials with some of the new uh, NST medications, the integrase strand uh, transfer inhibitors. What are your thoughts about that that you've been seeing in your practice, and how concerned are your patients about that? Some, <clears throat> some of my patients are very concerned. Uh, some of them don't want to be on one of these uh, second generation integrase inhibitors because they've heard about weight gain especially uh, the female patients, um, because it seems to be uh, a higher risk uh, in women, uh, the weight gain problem. Um, it seems very almost random. Um, uh, it's not universal at all that people will gain weight on these drugs, but there's an occasional person who gains a lot of weight, and, and that's a little bit um, disconcerting. Uh, the problem is that there are multiple reasons why people may gain weight and why people may have central obesity. Right. Uh, it's not only the meds, but uh, population is aging. So pe you know, people without HIV still get a, a gut as they get older frequently. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the, the COVID um, weight gain that is, is uh, more commonly than not, people have gained 10 to 20 pounds in the past couple of years. They're, they're staying home. They're not uh, doing their usual physical activity. They're, the the sales of snack foods are up through the roof. So, it's a, it's an interesting discussion with patients now who are on antiretroviral therapy, aging and gaining weight and and multifactorial. So, it's it's been rare that I've actually. Um, uh, switched people's antiretrovirals because of weight gain, but it has happened. And, um, you know, the last thing you want is uh, somebody to be taking medicine that they feel is harming them. Right. And we have a lot of choices. So if somebody is convinced that their HIV medicine is doing something to them that they don't like, uh, again, back to respect, you need to respect mm -hmm. that, understand that, 
not argue with them and say, this doesn't make sense, but, but see what other options there might be. And you know, the guidelines, we have to remember those guidelines, the tables we saw, those are for starting therapy. But sure. in terms of, of switching, we have a huge array of options. So, so it's really wide open what people can switch to. So Scott, uh, just expanding on what we just said about you know, respect and listening to patients historically and presently, uh, any thoughts on that, what we just talked about? Sure. You know, people that are living with HIV, you know, especially those who are treatment experienced, you know, they're often acutely and keenly aware of their body's response to, well, probably anything for that matter. And, and it goes back to exactly what you're saying is a, a bi-directional conversation with your doctor and the patient, right? Being honest helps your doctor, you know, determine the course of your care. And if you're noticing some of these things that are subtleties, you know, they can indicate that maybe something isn't quite right and it should be your prerogative. It should be your choice to then bring this up to your doctor to say, what can we do together as a care services team? Maybe it's even as simple as I'm having treatment adherence issues. Maybe I'm, I, you know, I can't take my pills every day because they're either too many or it's the not, not the right thing, but keeping yourself closed off to that conversation with your provider certainly doesn't help you. And this is a lifelong course in that respect. So yet you really have to have that conversation, especially as we age, bring up these issues back and forth. Yeah, I, I, that's just a great point. And transitioning to exactly what you're uh, talking about, um, we'll switch gears or just kind of move forward with this. We were talking a little bit and we've been dancing around it with this conversation about the graying of HIV is how you know we, we speak it in the communities. But Folks who are getting older, and I think the statistic often goes that 50% uh, or a little over 50% of people living with HIV in the United States are over the age of 50. Um, so are there certain considerations, Scott, and then we'll, we'll bring it to Peter as well, certain considerations that we have to think about, providers should be thinking about uh, when addressing the healthcare needs of someone who's living with HIV and getting older? You know, aging and chronic inflammation issues, you know, they have a, a first multiplier effect and care coordination, optimizing care coordination becomes so much um, more important as we age to be able to deal with these multimorbidities, whether it's, you know, not just HIV uh, medication, but it's, it's making sure that your you know, your, your, your bones are up to, you know, the bone density, your bones are up to good, good enough stuff that you have core muscle core, that you have, um, you know, a healthy diet, all the supportive services activities that make us functional and, you know, <laughs> daily living. Um, if you're having challenges with some of these things, they should be brought up to your medical case management team or a non-medical case management team that helps engage in all those services so that you can get an extra boost or an extra help for some of the challenges that you'd be facing, You know, whether that's insurance navigation or whether that's nutrition, maybe you're not getting the right nutrition, maybe you're not getting the mental health sure. and supportive services because you're living in an isolated um, environment in many respects. As we age, we pull closer in and we need those supportive services around us to help us manage this life. Scott, in your experience, do you see, um, and this gets into the conversation about uh, HIV exceptionalism um, and those kind of dynamics with, yeah. particularly with clinical provision of services. Do you, do you think, or is your experience, or do you feel that a lot of these HIV specific or ID, infectious disease specific clinics have the capacity to deal with the diverse aging internal medicine healthcare needs of people living with HIV, particularly when HIV isn't their main concern because they're virally suppressed. What's your experience or what, what are your thoughts about where we are in making that progression of being able to care for uh, these primary care, these healthcare maintenance needs of our aging population of people living with HIV? Sure, you know, most docs are comfortable with the management of some of these antiretroviral therapy, but many HIV providers, many of whom who are aging out or retiring, and the new ones that come in, they have limited training on how to recognize or even manage some of these geriatric syndromes, mm -hmm. especially in the context of multimorbidity and HIV and an unmet ancillary services need. So 
what we see is it, it is an emerging, you know, increasingly vulnerable populations. Um, and, you know, try to get all of those questions in about your life in 15 minute intervals with your doctor. And you have a complex challenge for the individual as well as the provider to be able to health navigate this individual to get them the services that they need. That's a challenge that we have right now. And there aren't enough resources that are being put into this silver tsunami that is coming up. You know, 70% of all individuals by 2030 are going to be over the age of 50 with HIV. Mm -hmm. We're now going to be having a bookended pandemic of individuals that are young, that knew less um, uh, issues with respect to, you know, finding a doctor, getting on medications that they need versus the unique challenges of individuals who have been on medications for 30 years or have had HIV for 30 years. And as they age, they're not gonna also age in place, right? There has to be lots of other supportive services to get them into that geriatric system. Yeah, one of the particular challenges I find in, in my practice is getting people specialist referrals, uh, yeah. particularly when they're uninsured, when you're dealing with people who right. may have chronic kidney disease, or as an internal medicine doctor, I can handle um, diabetes to a certain extent, but once it starts getting into some more complex insulin, insulin regimens, pumps, those kind of things, I may need to refer to an endocrinologist. Having somebody uh, that can go to colorectal surgery or some of these other things. Peter, you're an internal medicine doc and you deal with both people living with HIV and people who aren't living with HIV. How are you doing this with maintaining um, a practice that addresses all these complex issues as people age? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, I like to, uh, in my mind, I like to think about cohorts of folks with HIV and the folks that I take care of with HIV that are older, let's say over 50 or over 60, they have a very different life experience from the younger folks with HIV. In fact, I think somebody who's diagnosed now at age 25, when they're 70, it's, they're not going to be like the 70 year olds that I see now. The 70 year olds that I see now may have been viremic for a long time before they started treatment. They may have experienced toxicities from the earlier meds. And both of those things impact their health now as far as comorbidities. They, they have a lot more risk of comorbidities that are associated with inflammation because of unsuppressed viremia in the past. In terms of the, the um, comorbidities themselves, uh, like you, I, I try to treat most of them myself. Mm -hmm. um, over time, I've kind of assembled a cadre of, uh, of specialists that are not afraid of HIV and kind of understand um, that not everything that the person is experiencing right now is because of their current meds, because I'm, I'm giving them meds that aren't doing those things. Um, but it can be still, it can still be hard, especially certain specialties, like we don't have great HIV cardiology locally, um, things, things like that. And then uh, the patients that I take care of that are on Medicaid or uninsured, it is very hard to get uh, specialty care for them. You just end up doing more yourself and uh, looking it up and trying to do the, do the best you can. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, Scott alluded to this earlier, but some of the just activities of daily living, it's hard enough for people who, even mm -hmm. if they're not living with HIV, having issues with, you know, cognitive declines, forgetting stuff, early Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, hearing loss, uh, feeling socially isolated, as well as, um, you know, feeling kind of pushed to the side also with the assumption from providers that they may not be engaging in sex or no one screening them for mental health, uh, where their mental health is dealing with all this. And now you throw HIV into the mix and it's even more of a complex issue. Um, Scott, if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what do you see as some of the the social challenges of people living with HIV and aging with HIV, particularly some of the long-term survivors um, that have been living with HIV for 20, 30 years. What are some of the things that you, you've experienced and you've seen in your work? You know, we, we you know, at Health HIV, we did um, second annual state of HIV survey. And we found a, a really startling figure that about 35% of individuals who are living with HIV over uh, 50 
didn't interact with an individual for over 48 hours in that period of time, right? So the daily activities of living, if somebody has a, a core um, you know, muscular issue, just being able to get up then puts you at a further sedentary lifestyle challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, to be able to even go out and do grocery shopping on your own, and then you factor in COVID, and you have individuals that are fearful of walking outside, even with a mask or vaccinated, and, and right. there's concerns in that respect, right? Um, you know, for individuals that have been living with HIV for 30 plus years, right, there is a, there's an urgency to making sure that their care coordination is optimized because they do have some of the most unique and um, challenges uh, out there with respect to, you know, cardiovascular disease, bone frailty, you know, mental health. Um, and then when you exacerbate um, substance use disorder on top of that, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was an article that put out uh, recently that said individuals with substance use also have a further greater risk for COVID. So as you age and you look to challenges and you don't have a supportive system around you, you may turn to other systems that were, that were um, you know, more challenging in social circumstances and that could put you at further risk. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, do you... Would you recommend for providers that are navigating patients uh, dealing with some of these social and medical challenges, are there resources uh, they can turn to either online, federal, local, state uh, that can help them kind of navigate some of these issues that we've discussed? Sure. You know, so many of the aid service organizations that are regional um, certainly have those resources available for each individual by a geographic. Um, mm -hmm. And if not, if, you know, a lot of times you live in seven, secondary urban markets where there isn't an aid service organization, but there's often the community health clinic um, that certainly will have those resources available to you. And they often have healthcare navigation on site to help an individual maintain, um, you know, access to care services and then figure out some of the challenges that they have that might be transportation related, that it might be related to, you know, economic circumstances, you know, maybe they can't pay for their copays for their medications. They will certainly be able to help them engage in the services that way. Okay. Uh, uh, Peter, any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I want to emphasize the concept of social isolation that Scott alluded to, and I, I thought that was very interesting, Scott, that some people uh, report no human contact in the last 48 hours. Uh, a lot of the older folks living with HIV lost most or all of their peer support uh, during the bad days of the epidemic. Everybody died, including maybe their partner that they were hoping to age with. Um, so they've lived uh, a fairly isolated life and they may actually have PTSD from those bad days. And a, a number of people now that I take care of basically are home alone aging. And as long as their bodies hold up, they're okay. But as you said, when things start to happen, they fall, they get a fracture, they have no support. But there's also kind of the chronic low-grade depression that people have when they, they're sort of like Holocaust survivors. You know, that they've been through the Holocaust and they survived, but the people that were around them to support them aren't there. And I, I see a lot of people with kind of this chronic uh, low-grade depression and hopelessness uh, related to this history. It's a, it's a really difficult problem. Yeah, and I think it, it I couldn't agree more. And I think, um, you know, providers need to think about some of the screening tools, you know, that are in our arsenal. And I, I mean, Scott alluded to this earlier, but, you know, we just don't have enough time in 15, 20 minutes, but being able to do a neurocognitive assessment, being able to do mental health screening, uh, being able to do housing, all that kind of stuff, you know, there are screening tools that were recommended, but it's really hard as primary care providers for us to be able to do that. But we're going to have to figure out something because this tsunami, as Scott said, is not going to stop. Like this is going to keep moving in this direction. So we need to shift with that. I wanna focus a little bit as a part of this activity, we conducted a survey with Health HIV in August of 2021. And there were 85 participants and all are currently diagnosed with HIV and all are receiving treatment for HIV and residing in the United States. Um, considering the fact that over 80% of the participants are 55 years of age or older. 
Uh, I want to take a closer look with both of you at some of the issues they're dealing with and discuss how we would address some of these things. Um, so let's look at some of these chronic conditions. Um, I do want to take a look at actually uh, some of these conditions like cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, lung disease. Peter, are these things that you're seeing in your practice as well as neuropsychiatric disorder? Um, uh, does this kind of reflect what you're seeing in your practice? Oh, for sure. Um, and again, <clears throat> we know that, that chronic inflammation is a risk factor for a lot of these things, as well as um, subtle immune dysfunction in the sense that some cancers are harder to treat or people's prognosis is worse uh, if they're living with HIV, even if the HIV is suppressed. Mm -hmm. I've been surprised by uh, finding occult cardiovascular disease in, in fairly young folks. Um, and as we mentioned before, the, the, the screening tools that we use based on labs and age, et cetera, um, underestimate the risk. So I've actually been doing more uh, coronary calcium screens uh, if the person can afford it because it's not covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes been very surprised by finding in, in someone who feels well and doesn't have any symptoms, yet they have significant uh, coronary artery disease. So the, the concept is to try to, to screen for these things maybe more aggressively and possibly earlier uh, before they get out of hand and become symptomatic. Right. And Scott, I want to ask you about um, kind of the significance of emotional aspects of HIV. We've talked about this uh, during this conversation, but depression, anxiety, um, and we can see that it impacts people significantly. Uh, do some of these numbers when it comes to uh, the emotional aspects of HIV, are you seeing this play out in your work as well? Yeah, certainly. In fact, I, you know, I, I would say that they're, they're probably undercounted in some respect, right? You know, that personal sense of agency, when you admit to someone that you have an emotional problem or you have a mental health concern, you know, of depression, anxiety, there is a stigma at attached to that as well that often then gets built into your narrative in many respects, right? That can only further exacerbate or it can bring it out into the open. And if you have an open and affirmative provider or system of providers that can help you engage in those systems, oh my gosh, you know, the great feeling that you actually have, the, the you know, shedding that, that weight that you can share your depression and anxiety with another individual and it may not necessarily lead to another pill on top of that, but it can lead to another support system that sure. you can turn to, to help have these conversations. And it might be anxiety or depression for certain aspects that are treatable through cognitive behavioral therapy, through talk therapy, or for some individuals, right? It may lead to medications and what an opportunity that will be to help, you know, shed away some of that own graying of HIV themselves. Yeah, and I think it speaks to what you're saying about quality of life, not just being viral yeah. suppression. And we can see from some of these survey results that people are extremely satisfied. A lot of people are extremely satisfied with their ART regimen um, and how they're achieving viral suppression. But I think where the rubber meets the road moving forward is speaking about a little bit more than that. So quality of life is not just keeping someone virally suppressed for all the providers out there, if that's the easiest part that someone's able to maintain, we do need to focus on these other things. Um, this, uh, I wanna throw it back to you, Peter, before we wrap up, but this was a question about considering your current ART regimen, how satisfied are you with the side effects? You can see that uh, close to half of these um, participants in this survey said they were extremely satisfied with the side effects. How are you seeing this kind of play out in your practice? Are our are, are patients, for the most part, pretty satisfied with uh, with the side effects that they get from their ARTs or not? You know, I, I think it keeps getting better over time, but it also sort of depends on, on their provider. Um, <clears throat> providers that do a lot of HIV care uh, have a bigger repertoire of other choices. And so uh, occasionally I'll see a patient coming from a provider who was really just maintaining their ARV regimen because the viral load was suppressed. Uh, and the, the patient was experiencing side effects, but felt like that was the price they had to pay uh, mm -hmm. to keep the virus suppressed. And so educating patients, there are other options. I even see that, I certainly see that within my practice too, that patients assume that the diarrhea or dizziness 
is just something that they need to accept. And, and they may be in the group that says somewhat satisfied. Uh, they may not know that there are options that don't do those things and that they could have a better quality of life. Yeah, I agree. And I've seen, there have been patients that I've had that had either had side effects of like uh, nightmares, sleep disturbances, uh, mental health uh, alterations, or diarrhea, like you said, and they won't know it until they actually get off the medication. <laughs> and they're so reluctant yep. to change the medication because obviously it's working, it's keeping them virally suppressed, but then they're also like, well, when I tried it, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, well, that diarrhea that I had before, now that's gone. So I guess it was the medication, but it's almost like you take the bad with the good and you realize that right. for the sake of viral suppression, you just put up with certain side effects, like you said. And um, I think as science moves along, as we get better regimens, we have to be the ones that lead our patients and hold them by the hand and say, hey, this is not dissimilar to what was happening in the 80s and the 90s and the early aughts, where we were ha holding people's hands and saying, hey, we've got new medications out that are better with less side effects. Just because it's a single tablet regimen doesn't mean that we can't improve on that single tablet regimen and make it better, smaller, faster. I sound like I'm saying something from the $6 million man right now, but something that's going to be better and more tolerable for them in their mm -hmm. lifetime. So Peter, shifting gears for a little bit, um, what about your decisions in the setting of confirmed virologic failure? Uh, someone who's uh, doing well on meds or maybe starts meds and doesn't quite get virologically suppressed, what do you do in that case? Um, and what are your options? So in my clinical experience, there's sort of two kinds of virologic failure. And, and I'm dealing with two different patients now that are examples of that. So one person who is on a, a second generation integrase regimen um, comes in with a viral load of 40,000 having been suppressed in the past. And uh, the first clue is that, that even though he uh, maintained that he'd been taking the meds all along, uh, the pharmacy reported that he'd only refilled them one time for 30 pills in the past six months. Uh, we talked to him about it and he said, no, you know, I'm taking every day. Comes back three months later, his viral load is 10,000 and genotype shows wild type virus. Hmm. So this is somebody who really isn't getting the meds in and it's, it's very hard. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a interpersonal psychosocial problem dealing with somebody who tells you they're taking their meds every day and they're obviously not. And so right. that that's a, a, a challenge. I'll just I'll just say that you have to kind of break through that somehow. The other person is somebody who's been on a non nuke based regimen since 2001 and has been suppressed all along, but his viral load started creeping up uh, 100, 250, 600. And his genotype did show resistance. And, and that's, that's really confirmed virologic failure. That's not an adherence problem. And then somebody like that, uh, you base it on the genotype at the time of mm -hmm. failure. So the genotype will tell you what drugs won't work. Somebody with uh, failure on a non-nuke should go on to a regimen that's based on either a second generation integrase inhibitor or a boosted protease inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the, on the uh, genotype. Uh, the one pitfall and the one uh, concept that I'd like to just recommend is uh, it's not an excuse to give the person old toxic nucleosides as part of their new regimen. We have right. enough other choices that we don't have to do that. Right, I would agree entirely. And I think particularly about your point about adherence. I think a lot of times we knee jerk into thinking that there's automatically resistance um, that's based on just the medications failing. And we don't actually talk about in a very sensitive and non judgmental way about adherence, the patient's beliefs about what's going on, what's going on in their life, and then explaining to them, I can't tell you the number of times I've had patients that because they were running out, either because the ADAP wasn't recertified or some other gap was happening, that they started to take their medications every other day or every mm -hmm. third day. And they think it's kind of like high blood pressure and diabetes. And I have to explain to them, don't ever do that again. Um, yeah. It's kind of like when people put hydrogen peroxide on a wound, I'm like, don't do that. It could <laughs> cause, you know, a burn, a chemical burn to you. So, uh, you know, it is one of those things where I think you have to check adherence. And then, you know, part of what we're seeing from some of these guidelines about switching and when someone has virologic failure is talking about making sure they have two, at least two working medications mm -hmm. on board. But we do know that there's things 
uh, you know, with durable medications like a boosted PI, like Darunavir, um, like the new Insties that you're talking about that have a higher genetic barrier to resistance. And so those are kind of, we use the phrase uh, workhorses in the past, that those are the ones that you really wanna make sure someone gets on and not go back to some of the other more toxic or failing categories of medications that we've had. I mean, I think that's a good approach to start with. Now, supposing you have a patient who may fail either one of the durable ones, either the PIs, which we see less likely, or the INSTEs that I've seen rarely but can happen. Um, what are some of the new developments and some of the new classes of medications that we have coming down the pipeline that can be a safety net for that uh, those patients that are actually having trouble with uh, virologic failure, even on some of the durable medications we have at our disposal now? Well, you know, I think it's really an exciting time now because we do have new classes coming in. We we now have our first uh, attachment inhibitor, which has already been uh, approved, uh, Fostemsevir. And then in the pipeline, we have this Latrovir, which is an NRTTI, a, a mm -hmm. nucleoside uh, what, reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Uh, we have Lenacapavir, which is the first uh, capsid inhibitor. We have a maturation inhibitor uh, in the works and a, a long-acting non-nuke. One thing that all of these drugs, well, at least some of the drugs have in common is a very long half-life. So not only are they new classes, which is useful for people with multi-resistant virus, but also uh, they lend themselves to regimens that are what I call less than once a day regimens. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, besides uh, being a great hope for those last few patients that have very, very resistant virus, uh, these may end up becoming almost a new standard of care or at least a new option for people uh, that where they can treat their HIV without taking a pill each day. They may uh, be able to take a pill on some less frequent basis than once a day, mm -hmm. say once a week, or they may have some perennial administration where the, the medicine is given on a, a month or two month or six month basis. So kind of exciting things coming. Yeah, I agree. And um, one of the things, uh, ibilizumab, uh, we didn't mention, um, the yeah. infusion, I, I think one of the drawbacks, because that's given every two weeks, one of the drawbacks that I had, obviously, and I, I think we have to keep in context that the majority of patients do not experience virologic failure. Like, I think some of the studies that I've seen, that it's been less than 1%, like maybe 0.8% or 1.8%, something very low. But unfortunately, the patients that are really struggling, experienced, and have virologic failure will take up a lot of time and resources because it's so complex with what you have to navigate on getting them. And when you look at a medication like Fostemzavir uh, as an attachment inhibitor, when you look at a medication uh, like ibilizumab, which is more of a monoclonal antibody that you know you can infuse every two weeks, uh, do you have experience with the infusions uh, getting somebody to that point or have you not uh, traversed that yet? We, we have one person on ibilizumab um, we have one person on Fostemsevir. Um, yeah, ibilizumab is, is a challenge because it's IV. I mean, it's not only every two weeks, but it's IV, which means it can't be self-administered. Yeah. The person has to go to an infusion center. Uh, it's wonderful that we have it because uh, it's, it's a little bit unfair that some folks who did everything we told them to in the 1990s got a virus that now we can't treat. Right. Um, so, so having that option is great, but um, the, the other, honestly, the big option with ibilizumab is, is coverage. Uh, and our patient, unfortunately, the good part is that he's a working guy, you know, so he has a good quality of life, but his insurance just changed. And after having uh -huh. fought to get it for him, now we have to repeat the battle again with a new insurance company. All right. Yeah, there are some barriers with some of the newer medications in the pipeline. Scott, I'll bring it back to you as we go to some of our final thoughts. Um, can you sum up for the people that are watching uh, this session that we've been going over for the past hour or so, some of your main take home points to the learners, um, and then also any perspectives on future directions in the management of HIV from your, your vantage point, and then we'll, we'll throw it back to Peter. Sure. You know, from the start to the end of the conversation, it's always about a bi-directional conversation with your provider. It's, it's being open and honest about what affects you so that your provider, whether it's your doctor or it's a non-medical case manager who can help you get engaged in the healthcare system, 
um, you have to be open and honest with them because it will ultimately benefit you in that perspective, right? And especially as we age with a lifelong condition, being open and honest is, is so, so wildly important. You know, the perspectives on future directions in management of HIV is, is at least from our perspective, from a patient advocacy cost. It's a cost affordability issue. I mean, these innovative therapies and treatments are fantastic. And I'll use the word game changer for many individuals that live on the margins of HIV or the social determinants of health. Either you have the selective pressure and have resistance, or you have selective pressure in your own economic life and circumstances that pushes you to other um, medications that may be newer, but you may be on a Medicaid program or you may be on an program where your formulary list is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's based on that cost issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the future challenges will be, how do we pay for these medications? But not just how do we pay for these medications, but how do we also look at it from a patient provider decision-making opportunity right. so that we can have these bi-directional conversations, right? If we only think of it in terms of cost, then being open and honest with my provider about what my issues are, if I can't afford them or if I can't pay for them or you can't pay for them, doesn't do any good in that respect. Yeah, those are all great points. Uh, Peter, same questions, uh, take home points and perspectives on future directions. Well, I mean, I think it comes down to, again, uh, number one, respect. As I said before, you know, having a good rapport with the patient is huge. And then number two is just knowledge. It's, it's actually not that complicated to treat HIV. Some primary care providers um, are afraid they don't want to uh, harm the patient and do something wrong. But we train providers in our clinic, we train outside providers to, to treat HIV. And it's incredibly rewarding if you think about it. We, we forget that untreated, this is a, a uniformly fatal disease and it's not only fatal, but it tortures people along the way. And with mm -hmm. these meds, we, we, can, we can restore people's quality of life. I think that for future directions, we'll, we'll keep going in the way we've gone, which is making HIV as having as little impact on the person's life as possible. And that has to do with both their symptoms, their, their quality of life, but also having the meds be um, as non-intrusive as possible. So I'm actually kind of jazzed about the less than once a day thing because the less a person needs to do to keep the virus under control, the less impact it's going to have on their quality of life. Right. Um, yeah. And I think I would just add on to both of both of your commentaries and both of your final thoughts is that I, I've always argued that I do think at the end of the day, it's it's a battle of scientific advancement versus social progression. And we're doing wonderfully with scientific advancement. It's just the social movement uh, is what lags behind. And unfortunately, if people are dealing with social issues that don't allow them to partake or benefit from the scientific advancement, then we're not gonna go anywhere in eradicating this HIV epidemic that we're currently struggling with. Um, that ends our discussion for today. I wanna thank you again, Peter and Scott, for your insights and this wonderful conversation. Uh, and we hope for the learners that you found the activity informative and useful to your practice and encourage you to download the supplemental program materials. Thank you very much for participating. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Parallel Perspectives, a unique look at HIV treatment decisions from the provider and the patient with doctors David Malbranch and Peter Shallot and patient advocate Scott Bertani. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerreview.com forward slash ZWH860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available.